Hi, Richard. It's great to have you uh, with me today for this interview, and thank you for your time. I think before we start, maybe you can tell us a bit more about yourself, your role, your background, your responsibilities at SCORE. Sure. Sounds good. Gil, it's a pleasure uh, seeing you and talking to you as usual. So I'm the Executive Vice President of uh, Growth and Development at SCORE uh, US, which essentially is all our client-facing teams, so our pricing, underwriting, uh, our client solution team, partnerships, health and wellness strategy. Uh, before that, I led our partnerships uh, business, which is really um, focused on uh, creating new products and offerings um, with distributors and, um, and, and various uh, insurance partners that we have in the market. Um, before that, I spent almost a little over 10 years uh, as the managing director of Remark um, in uh, North America and Europe, uh, which is a uh, insured tech consultancy group that really started as a direct marketing firm. And I was, um, uh, I co-founded a company um, before that. So I've had a long history in insure techs and, and entrepreneurship. Amazing. I think this leads me directly to the first question about the InsurTech situation. So yes. what, what do you think about, how do you see the current state yeah. of the insurance industry, especially in regard of the valuations that we are uh, having now in the market and the sentiment in the market? Are, are we sobering? Is this going to stay uh, for a long time with us? How do you see it? Um, so I think you have to go back a little bit back historically to kind of see the current state. Um, historically, if you go back three, four years ago, as you as you well know, the valuations were, I would, one would argue probably too high um, and too aggressive. And, but that was the market, right? I, I think there was no one doesn't, that the market is the one that set those, those rates. And so there was a lot of um, what was uh, coined as easy money flowing into a lot of these companies. Companies were incentivized to raise money rather than really worry about the fundamentals of, of being profitable. And, you know, so they kept raising and scaling and um, maybe some of them, you know, with, with not too much of the controls and the government's governance that they would have needed. But I also feel it swung maybe too much the other way, you know, so in a right. very short amount of time, companies went from basically as long as they had a growth story a lot of money would keep pouring in to having very defined profitability um, uh, timings which were 12 to 18 months so what I feel has happened in 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 the market is the companies that were on that uh, very big trajectory of of you know uh, raise a lot of funds had to grow um, you know, it, they weren't given they weren't given enough um, leeway and and runway to 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 make that happen, and so they kind of got washed by the tide because they didn't get any new money that would come in at much lower valuations, right? And right. So you either have to take a massive haircut for your your existing investors have to take a massive haircut to let new money in to let you survive, um, or you know you sell off or um, so. I think it it what it did is that it really hurt a lot of good companies that really could continue and had a lot to bring to the market. Um, and I could talk about that a little bit further. Um, so I, I, I do think it swung maybe a little bit too far the other way. And probably now there is an undervaluation that is happening, whereas there was an overvaluation that, that was happening. And, and in terms of timeline, what do you think would be the next phase of these companies yeah. in the future? Yeah, so I hope because part of the part of the, the reason um, that that I think this a lot of this uh, shame is that uh, what these companies help do in the industry, if I think about the life insurance industry, is they they were really at the forefront of pushing digitalization, optimization of of workflows, um, looking at the integration of health and wellness, bringing med tech, health tech, insure tech much closer together. And, and I'm starting to see um, gaps there where a lot of these companies were kind of pushing the incumbents 
And now the incumbents have kind of slowed down a little bit and said, well, you know, these companies are not around. They're not as incentivized to, to keep reinventing. So I, I think that's, that could be damaging on the short to medium term basis for, for the industry to kind of lose that innovation and that push. In terms of timings, I suspect that new entrants will, you know, with, with kind of um, um, more favorable business plans and, and uh, outlooks um, kind of being guided, uh, you know, I, I think that they'll come in at pretty fair valuations relative mm -hmm. to the market and they'll have a decent kind of growth trajectory. I, I think probably, you know, over the next year or so, we'll start seeing a little bit more stability, like who, who really is going to make it out of this and who's going to, to, to fall because there's going to be more failures and more acquisitions that are going to happen. Um, and then I hopefully, you know, probably a year out, and I'm just kind of, this is more gut feel than any statistical data that I can give you, probably a year out, I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing a pickup of valuations again and a little bit more um, emphasis on, uh, total innovation that that companies are contributing, and you know what that really means, and so not just the the PN, the pure PNL. Really, what what are they able to do for the industry, and how do you monetize that? Yeah, interesting. I I agree. I completely agree with you. I think that in some cases, I just felt that the incumbents were a bit happy of what they saw in the markets. Right? We told you you don't understand insurance. Uh, that's what happened. Yeah. But uh, I agree, yes, it's, it's interesting. I, I also agree the, the fact that we are going to see many more M&As and acquisitions, and uh, we'll, we will need to wait a bit more for the real survivors of this. Correct. Uh, this is, yeah. Yeah. And, and I'd like to, your comment on the incumbents. I, uh, I agree with you, you know, and obviously I work for a large incumbent. I would like to think that we're actually quite open to innovation and and but you know I look at I look at a lot of our a lot a, lo a lot of companies out there and I wouldn't say it's the company specifically there's some individuals who might be tasked with innovation who when you're in an incumbent it's hard to move it doesn't matter it doesn't matter um, you could have the best people but you know these these organizations take time to to move ideas through the system and the governance and the risk management and and you know that's 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 fair i mean you you or else it would be um it would be way too volatile and mismanaged so um i think what happens is maybe there's a little bit of pressure that got put off of some people's backs in some spaces who felt that they had to to kind of innovate and uh, and innovate quickly but right. on the flip side you know um it's a shame that it's by seeing failures or by seeing kind of uh, collapses of companies for, for purely financial reasons, right? Not because the ideas weren't good. I think that's right. important to keep in mind, not because the, um, the premise wasn't good, because the valuations were too high, new monies is almost impossible to get in. Mm -hmm. and, and basically, you know, it kind of collapses and doesn't make sense. And that's why some of these companies are, are, are failing. Yeah, that, that's correct. So, so it leads me to my next question to you, uh, Richard, uh, about the trends. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm very intrigued to understand how do you see or consider to be the future two or three major insurance trends in the market? Yeah. So when I think about the U.S. market, a couple that come to mind. Um, number one, I, I think a lot about distribution and, you know, the traditional distribution is not growing, right? So there's less and less uh, agents, new agents coming into the market. There's very big consolidation, uh, M&A acquisitions that are happening between distributors. Um, there, there isn't yet a solution in terms of um, really attracting new people to distribution and, and to, to, to really being able to, to sell insurance and derivative products. Yeah. And so that's, that's a first one is the consolidation of, of distribution. And what does that mean for life insurance carriers when you have more and more distribution that's tied up in one place where they might have certain partnerships, they might want to go up the value chain a little bit further, they might want to own their own assets. So that's, that's one trend that I'm looking at. Um, the second trend that I would say is, is another one that, you know, kind of um, high on our radar is um, what, you know, the capital efficiency of running certain life products like 
you know, term. It's, it's hard. It's a hard product to, to, to make work profitably. It's very, very price competitive. Um, but it's, it fulfills a very big need in the market, right? So there's a disconnect between right. how important it is for consumers and how much it's priced at and, and essentially what it takes for companies to be able to operate it. In some cases, they operate it as a loss leader, which is never you know, necessarily a good thing. Um, so how do, you, how do they optimize it? How do they digitize the products further? How do they go into niche markets that they can uh, make work? So that's the second one is really kind of that pressure right. on, on, on profitability of certain products. Um, and then the third trend um, that I don't think that is still, I'm starting to, I'm seeing more and more of, um, I would say a more kind of a full engagement model around the intersection of um, life insurance and, and healthcare. And what does that kind of really mean when we talk about prevention, when we talk about, um, you know, a managed care, um, you know, manage diabetes, and, and can you really create an ecosystem? Because there's, there's, there's a handful of companies that have created, you know, um, some, one very good one around uh, engagement, which is really dominant in the market. Um, but, you know, what about some of the medical advances, um, you know, cancer diagnostic, cancer treatment, prevention of certain diseases, and what does that translate to from a life insurance pricing perspective, um, and um, and and how does that really you know kind of impact the market? So those are the big three. Yeah, wow, that's amazing because I think that at the end all of, all these uh, are related to longevity, and w- what we see in the market now, not in the market, but on, on the medical side, is we expect longevity or aging or uh, lifespan would be much longer in the next two decades. And I think it, this will reflect on all the long tail products that we Correct. have in the insurance industry. Correct. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. Well, wow, Richard, this was amazing. It's always great to speak with you and I really appreciate your time here today. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining this uh, interview.